Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. So please let yourself find a way to sit that is comfortable and at ease. And listen not so much to remember something of the words, but rather if there's anything that resonates in what you know already to be true, let that touch you. The rest you can let go of, leave aside. So here we are together. We've finished the first day of this 10-day retreat. And the first days, even if you've practiced a considerable number of retreats before or over years, they're still a little bit difficult. Achy and sleepy and wandering and and the mind comes in and says, well, now, you know, was this the right choice? There are other things I could have done with this time. Might have been more pleasant. A poem for you from Laurie Anderson. In the Tibetan map of the world, the world is a circle, and at the center there's an enormous mountain guarded by four gates and dragons. And when they draw a map of the world, they draw the map in sand, and it takes months, and then when the map is finished, they say a few prayers and erase it and throw the sand into the nearest river. Last fall, the Dalai Lama came to New York City to do a two-week ceremony called the Kala Chakra, which is a prayer to heal the earth. And woven into these prayers were a series of vows that he asked us to take, and before I knew it, I had taken a vow to be kind for the rest of my life. And I walked out of there and I thought, for the rest of my life, what have I done? This is a disaster. And I was really worried. Had I promised too much? Not enough. I was really in a panic. They had come from Tibet for the ceremony, and they were walking around Midtown in their new brown shoes, and I went up to one of the monks and said, can you come with me and have a cappuccino right now and talk? And so we went to this little Italian place. He had never had coffee before, so he kept talking faster and faster. (laughs) And I kept saying, look, I don't know whether I promised too much or too little. Can you help me, please? And he was being really practical. He said, look, don't limit yourself. Don't be so strict. Open it up. He said, the mind is a wild white horse, and when you make a corral for it, make sure it's not too small. And another thing, when your house burns down, just walk away. And another thing, keep your eyes open. Oh, and one more thing, find the right road, because it's finally time to go home. So here we are having promised too much or too little or whatever, but we're in it. And I chanted last night in the opening this praise to the Dharma. Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko Akaliko Ehipasiko Opanayiko Pachatangve Titapu Vinyuhiti Timeless, open-handed, immediate, visible to all who open their eyes and their hearts to see, bringing liberation, happiness. The text that teaches the practice that we're doing together most directly in the Buddhist, uh, in the Buddhist canon of teachings is the Satipatthana Sutta, or the text on the practice or the path of mindfulness. And it begins with an invitation somewhat like that chant. It says, my friends, this is the Buddha speaking, there is a most wonderful way for living beings to realize purification, to overcome directly grief and sorrow, to end pain and anxiety, to travel the path of wisdom and compassion, the true path, 
and to realize nirvana. And what is this way? It is the establishment of mindful awareness in this very life. Establishing mindfulness, resting in mindfulness, allowing mindfulness to be the abode of the heart. Now what's interesting about this text and the chanting that I did is they contain a paradox and as one practices Dharma over the years, one needs to become more and more comfortable with paradox. Because there's sort of, wherever you turn, there's a dimension of paradox. There's the personal sense of self and then the selflessness of things. There's the intention and dedication we make on one hand and the emptiness of things on another. And one of the paradoxes that you get comfortable with these texts speak to is the paradox of sudden and gradual awakening. That in some way they're saying here and now is an invitation to experience timelessness, joy, freedom, awakening. It is absolutely possible for you and for anyone who awakens to it. And it's not far away. It's no other place. The journey is not from here to there. The journey is from there to here. So this is the sudden truth. Immediate, open-handed, visible to the wise. And one of the things that was beautiful being around my teacher Ajahn Chah was the kind of joy that he exuded because he lived so much in the present moment. He wasn't worried about the future or the past. And he taught from the reality of the present. He said, people come here looking for the Buddha. They bow, they take refuge in the Buddha. But what is the Buddha? When we see with the eye of wisdom, we know that the Buddha is timeless, unborn, unrelated to any physical body or history or any image. The Buddha is the ground of all being, the realization of the truth of the unmoving mind. So the Buddha was not enlightened in India. In fact, he was never enlightened. He was never born and never died. This timeless Buddha is our true home, our abiding place. When we take refuge in the Buddha, all things in the world are free for us. They become our teacher, proclaiming the true nature of life. So he lived in this place of ease and freedom and realization. And when difficulties would come, which they did, as they do in every life, things that were, people would come with tremendous grief or loss or it would happen in the monastery, he would say, this is what grief is. This is the experience of it. It is the way that it is. Beautiful things would happen. He'd say, this is what beautiful things are like, without clinging. I remember being really sick with malaria in my little hut in the forest. And my head felt like it was going to burn up and explode at the same time. And my body was shaking with chills. And I was very, very sick. And um, he came to visit. And there I was lying and shivering and miserable. And he said, sick, huh? And I said, yes. He said, real sick, huh? I said, yes, very sick. He said, makes you think of your mother, doesn't it? You want to go home? I said, I kind of nodded. He said, yep, that's suffering, all right. You know it right there. This is what it is. This is dukkha. This is suffering. And then he smiled. He said, we've all had it because we lived in these jungles. We've all had it. Before, we didn't have very good medicine. Now the elders can bring you some medicine. It'll be all right. You know, you can do this. You'll make it through this. And he kind of smiled and looked at me. He said, you know, you can do this. It's just suffering, you know. And then he smiled again and he walked out of my cottage. And there was a sense of such both presence and compassion. Yes, he'd been through it all. And this was something that was workable, even though I thought I was dying. I said, think you're dying, don't you? Yes, it's okay. You can do this. He was, he rested in this space of awareness without fear of that which was difficult and without the clinging to that which was pleasant. And he didn't cling even to his ideas about things, you know. There was a nun who came to the Western monastery that he established. Um, 
a, a, a Western woman who ordained, and she was one of the first of his Western nuns. And she was a great meditator, had very deep experiences, and also was quite charismatic. So other people came to follow her, and pretty soon there was a group of a number of young women who'd ordained as nuns with her, and they would go and visit Ajahn Chah, but she became kind of their teacher, and the Western monastery had this group of nuns and monks. And after about five years, she disappeared. She left a note saying, I, this is all I can do, I'm leaving. Everyone wondered what happened to her. Well, about a year later, she showed up, no longer in robes. She had uh, converted, and she was a born-again Christian. And she had come back, not only to see her friends, but to help them see the light. And so she was there, and she was still this charismatic person, and she was saying, you're practicing the wrong way, and Jesus is the thing you know, that you need to understand, and that will liberate you. And she knew all the language, so it was kind of compelling and difficult. And you can imagine, they're already having a hard time just living over there in this jungle, in this foreign culture, and then someone's coming and saying, you're not, you know, you're not even doing the right thing. And so the people in the monastery became really upset about her, that she was coming and doing this, and she shouldn't, and all, of, all the conflict. And finally they decided they had to go to visit Ajahn Chah. So they walked the six or eight miles through the forest to the main monastery. And they bowed, and a group of them, and they said, you know, she's come back. He said, I've heard you know, this nun. And she's become a Christian. He said, I heard that, too. And she's telling us that we're not practicing right, and that we're missing the point, and all of these things. And you know, what do we do about this? They were really upset. And he looked at them and he smiled and he said, maybe she's right. (laughs) And laughed a little bit and they bowed and they went back. (laughs) He just didn't hold on to things. And it wasn't like, well, we're right and they're wrong. He, He wouldn't get caught in views and opinions and conflicts. Where, where he abided was a place of freedom, so he wasn't possessive, oh, my nuns are better than this nun, or something like that. And so he could play with whatever was there, and you felt it in him, this kind of graciousness. So that's the invitation of these, the sudden way of discovering this reality. But at the same time, that chant and these teachings and the invitation is also part of the text of gradual development, of how to cultivate or develop mindfulness and compassion again and again with breath and body and feelings and thoughts and so forth. And there's a whole text of the systematic training that says, as I read, There's this wonderful way for living beings to realize purification, overcome directly grief and sorrow, end pain and anxiety, travel the true path, realize nirvana. So even though it's already here, this awakening, this Buddha nature, the truth of who we are, still also we practice. And it says that this is offered first, to help living beings realize purification. Now that's an interesting phrase. We don't understand purification very well in the West. When you hear the word purification, it's as if you're impure. If you kind of look at it through Victorian, kind of Christian, Judeo-Christian eyes, well, purification means you're impure, and if you go through the right ritual or ceremony, that you get purified. But the meaning of this purification has nothing to do with sin or your lack of purity. Uh, You are fundamentally a Buddha. What the meaning of purification is, as my teacher, uh, Burmese teacher I sat with, he said, meditation retreats are a little bit like going through the laundromat, right? There's a kind of washing machine thing you go through. And I know when I come to sit on retreat, even if I've had months of ease and graciousness and equanimity that have grown in me over these years of practice. I come to retreat and there's a kind of accumulation in my body. And I sit down and part of the purification is just letting go 
of the collected tensions and memories and <clears throat> thoughts and feelings and all the things that are held, there's a kind of release that happens. Not in order to get something or get enlightened or some, something like that, but just to let go so that there's a kind of deeper openness or emptiness of body and nervous system and, and well-being and feelings in mind. Does that make sense to you? The other reason I sit beside to let things get clean, to kind of inner washing, is for the pleasure of it. As things open then to explore, to learn, to discover, to be alive. Suzuki Roshi calls this a general house cleaning of the mind. He said you come not in order to get something, but actually to clean the windows and sweep the floors and open the doors and so forth. And for Ajahn Chah, he said, you just take your seat, this one seat in the center of the world, and steady yourself with concentration on the breath and the body as we're beginning. And as you concentrate, purification happens. And the way that purification happens is here you are sensing your breath or sensing your body, if that's what you're focusing on. And as you're sensing your breath, all of a sudden tension arises or pain or or Uh, energy in the body and you let it come, you don't resist it and you still stay with the breath and by staying with the breath you allow all this other to come and release as it will in its own time without reacting against it and without grasping onto it. And by and by, by the very fact of staying steady and concentrating all the things that want you to not concentrate. There you're trying to be on your breath and your body says, no, 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 this and this and this. And you say, that's okay, there, there, it's all right, I'm staying with the breath for a bit. And it comes and it knocks on the door and you don't answer and it pounds on the door and you say, I know you're at the door, but I'm doing the breath now. And then it shakes the house, you know, and you say, okay, it's shaking the house. And you go back to the breath. And after a while it goes, okay, you're really staying with the breath, you know. And then the unfinished business of the heart comes. And the tears that we've carried from the last months of our life, of things that we've seen or felt but haven't had time to let ourselves touch deeply, the longings we have, the love, the, the visions that we want to honor, all the emotional body arises, and it knocks on the door. And you can bow to it, yes, there's this kind of emotion, and that, there's tears, oh, the ocean of tears, yes, and here's the breath, I'm right now being with the breath. And then anger comes, no, you're not, I'm going to get you, you know. Okay, here's anger, yeah, thank you for the story, that's it, and here's the breath. And after a while, they all come and go, and by virtue of attending to what's here, there comes a kind of purification because they lose their power. They start to release the, their, their power over you. And here you are. And the same with the storms of thoughts, views and opinions and ideas, how you should be and what you should have done and what other sh- people should do and how you're not doing it right even now. Remember what Julia Child said. She said, just remember this. If you're in the kitchen and you drop the lamb, you can just pick it up. Who's going to know, right? <laughs> you feel your breath. All these things come. You lose it for a little bit. It's okay. You come back to the breath. It's not about doing it right, but there's a purification that comes simply from your dedication and steadiness. And all these things come up, and gradually the mind begins to become collected and centered and steady. And the story that I sometimes tell, and very brief for the moment, is this um, Scandinavian story of the princess who was wedded, I think, um, she, was, she was betrothed to a dragon. Um, it was one of those marriages where the king and queen had gotten into a little um, debt and the dragon had all the gold. You know how those things happen in this world. So they said, oh yeah, he'd make a really fine husband for you, you know. And there she was, and it was a kind of a terrifying arrangement as far as the princess was concerned. Um, And she didn't know what to do, and she talked to everybody, and finally someone said, you know, down in the marketplace there's an old wise woman who, who knows about all things, including dragons. You better go talk to her. 
So she went to see the old wise woman. She said, my parents, they have betrothed me to this dragon. And the old wise woman says, it's going to be okay, but there's a little secret I have to tell you for your wedding night. And if you understand this, everything will be fine. Wedding night secret? People are listening now, right? (laughs) She said, on your wedding night, the one thing that you have to do is to wear, for your wedding and for your wedding night, instead of wearing a beautiful gown, you have to wear ten gowns, one on top of another. Okay, I will wear ten gowns. And then she gave her a second little instruction, which you'll hear in a moment. So they go through the wedding, you know, and the king and queen are happy because they get this huge mound of the dragon's gold as part of the deal, and things are all going to be all right. But the poor princess ends up after the wedding in the bridal suite, so to speak, with her and this scaly, fire-breathing dragon. And the dragon says, well, isn't it time, honey, for consummation of our... And she says, absolutely, my dear new husband. Um, but first, I must take off my wedding gown. Wouldn't you like that? He said, I would indeed. She said, but for me to take off my wedding gown, I would ask one small thing of you. He said, anything, my dear, that if I take off a gown, you also must take off a gown. Now, dragons are used to shedding their skin like snakes. They have scales that they... So she took off one gown, and the dragon, with his claws, took off a layer of skin. No problem. Okay. Then he looked over and she was still wearing a wedding gown. She said, oh yes, there was one under that. But I will take that off too, since I know you would like me to. And she took that off, but you too must take off one. And they went back and forth, one layer after another. And after a few layers, the dragon was having to actually claw the layers deeper and deeper as she took off each gown. Tremendously painful. She said, well, just a few more gowns to go, honey. (laughs) Took off another gown. And as the dragon began to claw and take off the gowns, his form began to change. And little by little, he looked less like a dragon and more and more like a person. Seventh, eighth, ninth. By the time she took the tenth gown off and he peeled the last layer off, there was, as in all good fairy tales, a handsome prince who'd been enchanted into a dragon, or maybe took that on for the fun of it. We don't know this moment in the story. So this is purification, really. It's not that you have to do something, but your steadiness allows the layers to open. Does that make sense to you? And an inner cleansing. And it's beautiful to watch from here, because we see you come in, some of you a little bit bleary, some tired, some restless, all this stuff, and as the days goes, go on, your faces get softer and, and more beautiful, and you look younger and younger. By the end of the retreat, I know we could sell this stuff in Hollywood. <laughs> By the end of this retreat, there is this sense of shining beauty that comes out of each of you. So this is the, the layers of purification. Then the text says also, you will... Realize purification, overcome directly grief and sorrow. O nobly born, you will overcome grief and sorrow. What does this mean? One of the beautiful things about the Dharma is that we face suffering, the sufferings of our life and the world. We learn about suffering and its end. And that's what's so refreshing, that we face the whole of life with its 10,000 joys and its 10,000 sorrows. And joy is like this and suffering is like this. And they're both part of the Dharma. And by knowing this, instead of being afraid or running away, there comes the overcoming of it. So John Kabat-Zinn, when he started his first clinic in the basement of the medical school in Massachusetts, 20 years ago, mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, He went upstairs to invite the other doctors to send patients down to him and did grand rounds at the medical school and said, I want you to send me the hardest patients, the ones that you can't help, 
Because there's a lot of times in modern medicine where it goes just so far, and then there are things that, that modern medicine doesn't know how to deal with. The ones with intractable pain and the ones with you know, anxiety and the ones with these kinds of diseases and you've done all you can. When you're finished and you can't do any more, send them down to me. And then he said, as we were talking about it, he said, that's because we have the strongest medicine. He didn't say that to the doctors, but he thought it to himself. And the medicine was the medicine of the Dharma. It was the medicine of the truth. That if you're in pain and you come down, he would say, you're in pain, here's how you work with pain. If you're in great fear, here's how you work with fear. If your body is falling apart in this way, let's work with this as it is. And because we know in the Dharma how to work with things as they are, there is an overcoming, a liberation that takes place. Text that says, The Dharma is medicine. Just as a capable physician might cure a patient who is in pain and seriously ill, so, my friends, whoever hears the Dharma of the Buddha, be it teachings, explanations, marvelous statements, or practices, sorrow, lamentation, grief, and despair will vanish. Just as if there were a beautiful pond with a pleasant shore, its water being agreeable, clear, cool, transparent, And a man or woman came by, scorched and exhausted by the heat, fatigued, parched and thirsty, and would step into the pond and bathe and drink, and all his plight and fatigue and feverishness would be allayed. So, my friends, whenever one encounters the teachings of the Dharma, all of the plight and fatigue and burning of the heart are allayed. We each have a certain measure of sorrow that's given to us. So when it speaks of overcoming grief and sorrow, the sorrow of our personal life or the sorrow of the world, the Dharma becomes the medicine for this. And I remember when somebody asked the Dalai Lama, who carries a tremendous burden of the struggles and the losses of Tibetan culture and the Tibetan people, how he could be as happy as he is with all that sorrow. And he said, well, you know, they have destroyed our temples. They have uh, destroyed um, our sacred texts and burned them. In many ways, they've tried to destroy our whole culture. Why should I also let them destroy my peace of mind? Kind of remarkable thing to say. All those things have happened, and yet there is another reality. Why should I let them also destroy my peace of mind? When we were together on this panel in Washington, D.C., I guess it was a year and a half ago or so for the Mind Life teachings, and he was teaching about happiness and the kind of you know bubbly laughter that we know from the Dalai Lama, and some reporter went up to him afterward and said, you know, you had this New York Times best-selling book, The Art of Happiness. It was on the list for a whole year or two. And you teach it, and you exemplify it, even in difficulty. Could you tell, you know, microphone and, you know, video camera, could you tell our, our viewers what was the happiest moment of your life? And Dalai Lama paused for a moment, looked at the reporter and the camera, and said, hmm, I think now, and just broke into this big smile. So when it says overcoming directly grief and sorrow, it is the medicine of the Dharma that says this is the way things are, and it's workable, no matter what it happens to be. It's as if we sense something greater than the sorrows. As Tennessee Williams wrote, the violets in the mountains have broken the rock and that there's some beauty within us that is undeniable, no matter the measure of sorrows we've been given. Sometimes I read this letter that uh, describes one woman's great personal suffering. 
She said, my mother always assured me that unspeakable punishments were bound to befall any child as naughty as I was. Terrible, terrible letter. If I was you, she'd say, I'd be afraid to go to sleep at night for fear that God would strike me dead. She would speak these words softly, regretfully, as though saddened by her errant daughter's fate. And then she goes on to describe years of abuse. And she says, the most devastating words my mother ever spoke to me came when I asked her if she loved me. I'd just been escorted home by the police after one of my many attempts to run away, so it was bad timing on my part. She answered, how could anyone ever love someone like you? It took me almost 50 years to heal the damage from <clears throat> these ugly words. Recently, I remembered a childhood ritual that I told to my doctor. And as I told, he began to weep. From age five or six until I was in my teens, whenever I had trouble sleeping, I would slip out from under my covers and steal into the kitchen for a bit of bread or cheese, which I'd carry back to bed with me. And there I'd pretend my hands belonged to someone else, a comforting, reassuring being without a name, an angel perhaps. The right hand would feed me little bits of cheese or bread as the left hand stroked my cheeks and hair. My eyes closed and I would whisper softly to myself, there, there, go to sleep. You're safe now. Everything will be all right. I love you. And it's terribly painful to even read this letter, and yet it's also true that there are many people who experience this kind of suffering. And what's remarkable is not only the sadness of a child treated in this terrible way, but the intuition of the heart of this child to crawl under the covers and feed herself like an angel, to have that, the little green shoots of compassion come and say, there, there, you're safe now, go to sleep, I love you, everything will be all right. That something in us is inviolable and indomitable. And in this world, with its measure of joy and sorrows, something in us knows that closing down is not the way. Yes, we have our measure of pain and uncertainty, but in this vulnerable human life, every loss is either an opportunity to shut down and shut the world out, or to stand up with dignity and let the heart respond with compassion. And we all know this is possible in us. It is our Buddha nature. I saw it so clearly with my teacher, Gosananda, the Gandhi of Cambodia, with whom I worked over a number of years. And in, in recent years, um, he's gotten quite old and he's lost his memory. So almost completely. So for years he led these peace marches <clears throat> when the refugees in the camps <clears throat> along the Cambodian border were finally able to go back to their devastated villages. He said, you can't go back by bus or the UN wanted to transport them. He said, we have to walk back and we have to show people that we are people of peace. And so he led hundreds of people on peace marches back through the war-torn parts of Cambodia, chanting peace and loving-kindness until they got to their homes, and then he'd go back to the camp and get another 10,000 people and walk them back. And he did it year after year for a long time, in spite of grenades and people trying to shoot them. And the whole time he would do this prayer of loving-kindness, metta, and chant as they walked. He'd kind of be at the front of the line. So now he's lost his memory, Alzheimer's stroke, it's not really quite clear, but he can't even remember how to tie his robe sometimes. Uh, and yet, he still teaches. That is, some people will bring him to places to teach. 
And he sits up and he looks at people with these beautiful, beautiful smile and glowing eyes. And he chants the Sutra of Loving Kindness. And he just beams metta at everybody who comes. And I, I had this one very famous Tibetan Lama who spent some time with Gosananda and myself. And he said, oh, I wish he could come and teach at my center too. I just want him around. You know, he's... Um, and another, another uh, Lama, great Lama said to me, who is that, that guy in the bright orange robe who upstaged the Dalai Lama? You know, because sometimes they'll be together. They were really good friends. And what's beautiful about Gosananda is that he shows the possibility of overcoming grief and sorrow. And the Dharma is medicine. And it doesn't matter, you know, even that he's lost his memory. The spirit of his heart is so beautiful that he just loves every being that he touches. Realize purification. Overcome grief and sorrow, the measure of our sorrows with this beauty of our heart. End pain and anxiety is the next thing that it says. Now, I'm not sure that the government wants you to end your anxiety. They're putting out a lot of notices that you should be afraid, really afraid, and war on terror and things like that, which is a very strange phrase. It's like a war on fear, a war on a mind state. I'm not sure that that's going to be a terribly successful venture. Um, But instead, here we are breathing and being with things the way they are, taking our seat in the center of the whole world, this one seat, and letting feelings and thoughts and images and the joys and sorrows of life arise. And what does it mean to end pain and anxiety? The image that the Buddha uses is of the two darts or the two um, spears or arrows. One, the first arrow is the arrow of the particular pain that we're given. Maybe it's a disease in our body, or maybe it is a loss in our family, or maybe it is a conflict in our lives that we don't know what to do with. Some kind of suffering that comes to you, which will happen periodically. The second arrow is not shot to us, but it's the one we shoot into ourselves. We have that suffering or that particular pain, and then we add to it our fear, our confusion, our anger, our, our outrage, uh, our terror. We add to it all the forms of reaction that make it so much worse. So to end pain and anxiety means to simply be with the measure of joys and sorrows and gain and loss and periods of well-being and periods of difficulty. They are our human condition, our human lot. And to be with them, as it says in the great Zen text, without anxiety about non-perfection. This is enlightenment. To be awakened or liberated, enlightened, is to be without anxiety about non-perfection. That it's not perfect, and it never will be according to how you'd like it to be. It's the way that it is. So ending pain and anxiety is really the way that fear begins to drop away. And it's a beautiful thing as you practice over the years to sense how fear can fall away and drop away. And I see it in Gosananda and the Dalai Lama, but I see it in its own way in myself. That fears might even still arise, but it's just not very compelling anymore. They have their story. Oh, you're getting older. Your body's doing this. This is going to happen. Yeah, thank you for your opinion. That's a story. And it's true in a certain way. But that's not who we really are. And something in us knows this so deeply. And the end of anxiety isn't that that might not still arise, but that we begin to rest in a place of fearlessness that is our true nature. Annie Morrow Lindbergh, who writes about pain, she says, go with the pain, let it take you. 
Open your palms and your body to the pain. It comes in waves like a tide, and you must be open as a vessel lying on the beach. Let it fill you up, and then retreating, leave you empty and clear. With a deep breath, and it has to be as deep as the pain, one reaches a kind of inner freedom from pain, as though the pain were not yours, but your body's. The spirit lays the body on the altar. The end of pain and anxiety. What happens is that there grows through the deepening of our practice of mindfulness and compassion, a trust, a trust in healing, a trust in opening, a trust in something so much bigger than the small fears that we have about life. There's something so much more amazing that's going on. You know, it's said that in one scoop of soil, there's, I don't know, a million little microorganisms, bacteria and viruses and you know, paramecium and every kind of thing, that there's more life in one spoon of soil than there probably than there is on the whole, you know, the planet of Mars or some other place. That the life is so woven into the fabric of this particular planet that it's everywhere and it's teeming with it. And we're just part of this amazing dance. And we kind of get separated and think, well, we're just this little part, the small sense of self. And what the Buddha invites us to do is take this seat and feel our connectedness with everything. And I love it when I kind of read these wonderful stories of um, animals that we think of as different than ourselves. I I have a friend who went to visit this parrot in New York named Nkisi, who has a vocabulary of 1,200 words. And he said, yes, I sat down with Nkisi, and Nkisi said, oh, you're wearing a nice vest, you know. And I thought, wait a second, who's, you know, who's feeding this parrot lines? Your vest is like uh, George who comes over, right? And um, I was reading about this parrot as well because some researchers from MIT came down to kind of check out that it wasn't some hoax or something like that. They actually had a, a parrot in one of their labs at MIT also that could talk about different shapes and things like that. But this parrot was raised as a kid, so it had a much better vocabulary than you would if you were raised in the lab at MIT, which isn't good for anybody, really. (laughs) And it's just so amazing that here is this bird that actually, you know, welcomes you and talks to you and has a little bit of a conversation. Or this place in Tennessee that I'm sure a lot of you have heard about because it's been in the news, the Elephant Sanctuary, a woman who really loved elephants and bought at first a couple hundred acres in Tennessee for the old circus elephants and zoo elephants that were being let go because they couldn't work there so much anymore. And now it's grown. She's got a couple thousand acres and many, many elephants. But anyway, there was in the early years an elephant that was sent there named Shirley from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I think, in the zoo old elephant had been there for quite a long time and they wanted to get a couple of new elephants and so Shirley arrived and they put the elephants one of the people that worked there told me about this story they put the elephants in a kind of holding pen before they let them go out with all the other elephants so that they can see if it's how they're going to relate and this elephant was in there and the other ones all come by and stick their trunks in and kind of sniff the elephant and say hello and whatever elephants do for greetings But then one of the elephants came there and reared on her hind legs and trumpeted and beat the bars as if to break them down, and so did Shirley beat on the bars and so forth. And the owner of the place got really upset, like, what's happening with these elephants? And this happened a few days in a row, and she made some phone calls back to Baton Rouge, and has she ever acted this way? And then finally discovered that Shirley and the elephant that was there had both been together in the circus 25 years before for two years 
and they hadn't seen each other for a quarter of a century, and they just were happy to see each other. So when they let Shirley out, this person that works there was telling me, now you see the two of them walking along with their trunks together like this. <laughs> and, and somebody who's sitting on the retreat, who just came back from an elephant camp in far north of Thailand as part of her travels and adventures, said that she was riding on the head of the elephant, like the mahout, um, with some instructions. Um, and, and she said, you know, the elephants rock a lot, and it felt a couple of times like she might fall off. And as she started to slip a little, this big 50-year-old elephant um, could feel that and flipped her ears back and kind of pinned her legs in so to hold her to make sure that she would be steady when she was slipping. She said, and I could really feel, it wasn't just once, it was every time I got a little slippery, she would kind of hold me in place, make sure it was okay that we were going to get there safely. So we live in this extraordinary world which brings to us a river of joy and sorrow and, and um, light and dark and gain and loss and praise and blame and all of those things keep coming to us and yet there is in the practice of mindfulness and compassion the awakening of our Buddha nature a deeper and deeper trust that we can be with this river, this mystery that we're in. I mean, how did we get here in these bodies? And live in joy. As the Buddha says, live in joy and love even among those who hate, like Gosananda or the Dalai Lama. Live in joy and health even among the afflicted. Live in joy and peace even among the troubled. Look within, be still, free from fears and attachment, know the sweet joy of the way. And so we learn this. We discover it, we remember it, we come back to it. And it's a wonderful process of opening and unlayering and trusting. And as we do, there comes more and more a trust in the reality of the present, that we don't have to fix things or make them different. I mean, I remember being with this person that I was working with individually, um, and she had gone through all this trauma, and we worked with the emotions and the stories and so forth. And she said, I feel like if I let myself feel the level of grief and rage that I have fully, that it would just destroy me in the universe. And we did a lot of work to get to this point. Finally, I said, okay, let's see if it does. Because as you practice in Dharma, you get, it's like initiation or midwifery or something. You get a sense that the descent and the allowing of things is actually what brings freedom. So she closed her eyes and meditated, and we did this kind of guided visualization together. And she let this huge amount of rage and, grief and so forth. And after a while she said, it's, uh, it's terrible, it's done. The whole universe is just, I said, how big is it? She said, it's like a nuclear explosion and everything is black and dead and will never come back to life in me or anywhere. She was kind of weeping as she said it. I said, okay, just stay with this. This is your worst fear. And now it's happened and live with it for a while. So we sat with it. And I said, now, Let some time go by. She said, well, how much time? I said, I don't know, since we're doing as a guided meditation a hundred years, a thousand years, how much time it needs. said, that's pretty short. A million years? You're just here, and the universe has been destroyed as far as you can tell. It's black, and it's ashes, and there's nothing in it, and it's devastated. 50 million years, 100 million years, and this is five minutes or something like that. 500 million years. Take as long as it takes. And all of a sudden I noticed she shook her head a little bit. I said, what's that? She said, nothing. Okay, another 100 million years, another 500 million years. Just rest here. So now it's 10 minutes. Shakes her head again. I said, what's happening? She said, well, she said, there's something over there. I said, you want to see what it is? She said, not really. I said, well, you could wait a little bit longer, another hundred million years, okay? So we waited a couple more minutes. She said, it's still there. I said, well, take a peek. 
said, way at the far edge of the universe, there's this little green light. I said, find out what it is. Oh, it's a little green planet. And things are just starting to come back. The day my mother died, Thich Nhat Hanh says, I wrote in my journal, a serious misfortune of my life has arrived. I suffered for more than a year after the passing of my mother. But one night in the highlands of Vietnam, I was sleeping in the hut in my hermitage and I dreamed of my mother. I saw myself sitting with her and we were having a wonderful talk. She looked young and beautiful and her hair was slowing down It was so pleasant to sit there and talk with her as if she had never died. And when I woke up, it was about two in the morning, and I felt very strongly that I had never lost my mother. The impression that my mother was still with me was very clear. And I understood then the Buddhist teachings, which are very different than ordinary understanding. It's the understanding that birth and death are notions that they are not real. The fact that we think that they are true is a powerful illusion that causes our suffering. When we understand that there is no birth and no death, we are liberated from fear. So then I understood that the idea of having lost my mother was just an idea. It was obvious in that moment that my mother is always alive in me. I opened the door and went outside. The entire hillside was bathed in moonlight. It was a hill covered with tea plants, and my hut was set behind the temple halfway up. Walking slowly in the moonlight through the row of tea plants, I noticed my mother was still with me. She was the moonlight caressing me, as she had done so often, very tender, very sweet, wonderful. And each time my feet touched the earth, I knew my mother was there with me. I knew this body was not mine alone, but a living continuation of my mother and my father and my grandparents and great-grandparents of all my ancestors. These feet that I saw as my feet were actually our feet. And together, my mother and I were leaving footprints in the damp soil in the moonlight. Purification realize purification, overcome grief and sorrow, end pain and anxiety, and discover or travel the true path. Thomas Merton, again, who says, of what avail is it if we can travel to the moon, if we cannot cross the abyss that separates us from ourselves? And this is the true path, to come back to trust the reality of the present. The reality of the present, there is, says Alan Watts, an art of living that's neither drifting carelessly on one hand or clinging to the past on the other. It consists in being completely sensitive to each moment, regarding it utterly new and unique, having the mind and heart open and receptive, wherever we are. So the path is really the path where we are each moment. And when you look in the mirror, there's this amazing experience because you look older, right? And yet at the same time, there's a part of you that's saying, I don't feel older. And the reason that happens is that it's only your body that's getting older. Your body ages, but not the one who sees, not the one who knows. A friend of mine works in the hospice at Luginahanda Hospital, the Zen Center Hospice. And she said that she was working there, and then they brought in a man who was close to dying or quite sick, um, who was a prisoner. So he was shackled to his bed. They led him out of prison to come to the hospice. And she'd spent some days with him over a course of some weeks, and he didn't, never had any visitors. And she said, don't you have any family? And he said, I have, a, I have a mother who lives down in San Jose, but, you know, since I got in prison 10, 12 years ago, 
mean, I don't, I don't write to her. I don't want her to see me. She'd be so ashamed of me. She'd be so ashamed of me. And they talked for a while, for a long time, actually, about it. And little by little, this hospice volunteer said, you know, maybe she'd be ashamed, but here you are, and you're sick, and you might be dying, and don't you want to give her a chance in case she wants to see you once more? He said, I don't know, I don't know. She'd be so ashamed, I don't want her to see me. She'd be so angry, too, and upset with me. But finally, the hospice volunteer helped him write a little note to his mother. And sure enough, she called back, called the volunteer, and the volunteer picked the mother up and brought her to the hospital. And she said it was an amazing thing because this little old woman walked into the room and there was her son on the bed with the handcuffs, thinking that she was going to be angry and ashamed of him. And she stood in the door and just looked at him, looked him in the eyes for a long time, and then just went over and kissed him. My son. And it's this, when you look in the mirror and say, yes, your body has gotten older, but it doesn't feel like I'm aging. Because your body isn't who you are. And also the identities we take are not who we are. They're just temporary. To travel the true path is to awaken the spirit of who we really are. You, the richest person in the world, it says in the Buddhist text, have been traveling around begging, forgetting who you are, your own Buddha nature. When we know this, we realize nirvana. Zen Master Suzuki Roshi says, when you realize the fact that everything changes and find your composure in it, there you find yourself in nirvana. Or Buddha Dasa, my teacher, who wrote this little booklet called Nirvana for Everyone, says, we have experiences of nirvana all the time, but we discount them. In any moment, when we're not afraid or clinging or caught up, or where we've been caught up, and then there's a moment of seeing, oh, we were caught up. It's a coolness, a sweetness that comes to the heart. A looking at a tree, a taking our seat, a holding a cup of tea in our hands, a looking in the eyes of someone that we love. A moment of taking a step is a moment of nirvana, a moment of awakening. And you know this. You know this freedom and you know the path. Thus shall ye think of this fleeting world, it says in the Diamond Sutra. A star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, an echo, a rainbow, a dream. Life changes so much. And here we take our seat in the river of life and are invited by the Buddha and by all the awakened beings and by the awakening in ourselves to realize purification, to overcome grief and sorrow, to end pain and anxiety, to travel the path of wisdom and compassion, and to realize the freedom that we already know in ourselves. So somebody came to Zen Master Suzuki Roshi, a psychologist, and tried to question him about higher consciousness. Could you please explain enlightenment and higher states of consciousness? And Suzuki Roshi smiled and said, I don't really know anything about higher states of consciousness. I just try to teach my students how to hear the birds sing. Such a paradox that we are here and we do know freedom. And then we do the practice of reminding and letting go and opening and reestablishing the center of freedom. I hope you enjoy your practice. It doesn't have to be a grim duty. It's really a beautiful thing to be able to do it. And as you practice, may you more and more deeply come to learn what it is to live freely in the present moment, to live here and now in the reality of the present.